Rob Campbell, welcome uh, to the 42 Courses podcast. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know Rob, uh, he's won the most incredible, most awarded, marvellous strategists in the world. Um, currently based in Auckland in New Zealand, uh, but originally from Nottingham, which is not a million miles away from where I'm speaking from you. Uh, speaking from you, speaking to you from. Uh, <laughs> so, also, also, excuse my dyslexia. I'm going to get all my words wrong. But um, Rob, welcome. Uh, it's such an honour to, to have you on on the show, and really appreciate you taking the time out. Oh, thank, thank. I mean, that was a, a better introduction than I would ever get from anyone. So, thank you so much, and um, <laughs> thanks for having me. Let's hope I, I, you know, don't make you regret it. No, 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 oh. God, gosh, I mean, you know, I, I'm looking forward to it. We were, we were just having a quick catch up before and um, Rob Rob said that he was immune from maturity. So I think this is going to go absolutely perfectly well. Um, <laughs> it's, um, well I, yeah. I mean, maybe, um, maybe we can start at the beginning. I mean, you've had, so again, if, if, if you haven't, if, if you don't know Rob, he's literally, when I say he's incredible, he really is incredible. Um, but you, you've worked all over the world. You've worked for some of the most incredible agencies, worked for some of the most amazing brands. How on earth did you get into advertising? Um, like, was this, was this very mm. natural? Did you wake up one morning and go, I know, I'm going to be a strategist and then walk into Widen and Kennedy? Oh, or... <laughs> yeah, no, and no. I mean, it was like I wanted to be, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a policeman, which would have been a disaster. Right. Um <laughs> And then I wanted to be a rock star, you know, the usual thing. And I was a studio musician for a long time. And then I just, I, I fell into advertising. I, 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 and it's quite interesting because I, I'm always deeply suspicious of people who just want to work in advertising. Because I always feel that they're forgetting, like for me, I'm a culturally led strategist. I love culture, subcultures, basically. Um, and how creativity can really impact that. And yeah, so I kind of just fell into it. And to be honest, that's probably the best way it could happen. Um, I was a shit kicker, basically, and um, and a litter tray and just like real bottom stuff. Uh, what I liked most was that I didn't have to wear a suit. That was probably the greatest uh, thing for me. And that's because my entire family um, are from a legal background, but in a really <laughs> Like my mum, my mum is Italian. Well, she's passed now, but uh, she was Italian. All her family were lawyers against the mafia. My father, um, yeah, he was a human rights uh, barrister, like you've seen. And so me getting into advertising was basically the equivalent of me being, I don't know, a crack addict probably for them. (laughs) It's just like, what the hell? Even when I was a musician, um, you know, they they were always supportive. But yeah, no, I just fell into it. And then... I got to meet amazing people and I think I think that's what's kept me going honestly and I've, I've just been always open to stuff my, my attitude is if you're open to anything then everything can happen and I've just been like, like I, said, I love Nottingham I'm 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 proud of coming from Nottingham I used to think Nottingham was the greatest place on the planet um and the life that I've been able to enjoy is beyond comprehension but I'm not finished with it yet. But um, mm. just living in China, like at school, when I was young, I'm old now, you never learned anything about China. China was this invisible country. I spent seven years of my life there. It's the, my son was born there. It's the, most, it's the most special experience of my life to this day. So, yeah, I, I fell into it. But um, I keep saying, you know, I... I where people fall downstairs, I kind of fell upstairs and just somehow managed to keep doing stuff I found interesting and stayed in it. When you say you fell into it, I mean, <laughs> did you meet someone? Did you go to London? Did you? No, did my, you my, my dad had a friend who was involved in advertising who said, oh, oh you should think about it. Um, yeah. So there was an element of like Nepo by proxy uh, in some respects. Right. Um, right. But then, yeah, I, I was at an age called Hal Henry, uh, and I didn't know anything, and that was the starting point. And then it was just was a journey of individuals rather than agencies. I suppose the right. first agency I went to where, I mean, Hal Henry definitely had that aspect, but the first agency where I really felt there was a culture, not the bullshit contrived 
like um, annual report stuff that they write, but a real culture was at Wine and Candy. Um, and that was where I felt the agency was bigger than the individuals for the first time. And nice. I'll always be a child of theirs. It, it's, um, yeah, it'll always be very, very special to me. And there's, I've lo- worked at lots of places, but I like Colenso, I think. Colenso is some sort of, I don't want to, to recreate Wine and Candy, but there is naturally a bit of that feel here. But I, I, yeah, I do feel I like families, but I like families who are disruptive rather than just um, they lie to each other. <laughs> Let's keep everyone happy. Mm. And uh, where I've where I felt I thrived have been in environments either because the company's got that culture, which there aren't that many, or those individuals within it that have cultivated it. And uh, I've just been uh, immensely lucky in that journey. It's, it sounds like you, so it's the, the, the people at the agencies and the culture of the agencies that you're attracted to and, and there were, you, you didn't mention it, but I'm, I'm, sounds like maybe you found some amazing mentors as you went ahead, whether you called them mentors or not, but sort of sounds like you've met some amazing people who inspired you in certain ways and helped you onto the next journey. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, it's funny, I was talking to somebody about this recently, about about 10 years ago, I decided to write to every single person that I felt had had a significant impact on my career outside of my family, my parents. Um, and some of them I'd worked for and some of them I'd just met, but their advice was there. And it was amazing because nobody responded to me. And I'm going, Jesus Christ. And I spoke to one of them and they basically thought I, I had a terminal illness and I was saying goodbye to them but um i've i've got i have a lot of people that have made a massive impact on my life and my career and i have two that i rely on quite a lot for advice one's an ex-boss one's an ex-client um Mm -hmm. and they're proper mentors because i know that they want me to succeed but they will give me the ultimate gift of honesty so um and they've been really helpful, um, really helpful. But I have a lot of people that I talk to and listen to and value the opinion of. Um, but I've also, I, I'm, I'm driven by my gut a lot as well. So, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a mixture. I mean, it's certainly not, I used to live with somebody in Australia as a flatmate, uh, Holly, an incredible human. But she had her career, she was a different industry, but she had her career mapped out. And I used to look at her with like both admiration and just confusion because I couldn't work out how that worked. Um, Because for me, yeah, I've I've always gone where I feel excited and challenged versus a more linear career path. Um... And, but over time, I know what I'm shit at and I know what I'm really good at. So there was a time at Wyden where they, you know, started talking to me about, would I like to be a managing director? I wasn't even a managing director of the company I started at Cynic because I know that I'm a fucking good number two um, within a, a top hierarchy and, and I'd be a terrible number one. Um, and so, yeah, I, I've been surrounded by people who've had that. Sorry? Why do you say that? Why do you say you'd be a terrible be- Because um, Because my goal is to, I want to look after the, the quality. Of, for me, get to the best work possible and then the people win. But I feel that if you're a CEO, there's a lot more things you have to take on board. And I'm pretty simplistic. And so the idea of doing that, having all these different people that you have to manage, all this, it's just, I get to tell clients, colleagues, whatever, the truth, um, the real truth, Um, not honesty, truth. And there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if as a CEO, you could get away with that because, not because you're lying or anything, but because you have to have a much more um, sensitive, greater sensitivity to a bunch of different factors. And for me, I just run after the most exciting work and 
being a number two allows me to do that with way more freedom in my mind. Oh, I don't know. I think if you had your own company, you could you could say what you want whenever you want. Well, I, like, I did have my own company, and, and, and my partners also said uh, I wasn't allowed oh, to talk right, about yeah. money, <laughs> and I definitely wasn't allowed to talk about money. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I do, but I also have my other side of life where I work with a bunch of musicians and fashion um, royalty and but that relationship's different because they've asked me to be part of it right so i'm almost like a uh, a partner rather than an employee so it is right. it's probably all in my fucked up mind to be quite honest but um it makes me feel happier uh in that position yeah that makes a lot of sense and how did you end up in china you were there for six years you were saying yeah uh, se- yeah seven years um they well, both BBH and Wyden asked me to go there. And so I went, I'm not a particularly spiritual person, but I went, that's a sign <laughs> in typical. <laughs> and and also the other side of it was going, look, if it's BBH or Wyden, you go, well, you can't lose, first and foremost. Yeah. Secondly, China was the most economically influential market on the planet at a time when the world's economic situation was in dire, uh, dire straits. I went, why would I not do that? I've always gone to where the excitement is. Well, because all my mates said, you're mad. Widen and BBA is China. You're mad. What's going to... And it was the most... Yeah, it was just one of the most pivotal times of my life, uh, personally and professionally. And um, as much as China has many things wrong with it, as does every other country, I will mm-hmm. fight for that nation. Um, fight for it. It's misunderstood. It's subject to incredible corporate arrogance and prejudice and uh yeah i love it when uh, people come out and they go well look at this like, like even with the situation with tiktok there is no way that if tiktok had been created in america it would have encountered that level of prejudice against it yeah. um and there's no way that america is this like wonderful hey we're all good we never do anything wrong i, I just find the hypocrisy in it i'm not saying China's perfect, but my God, yeah. neither is the UK. And yet there's this arrogance and ignorance that goes around. And so for me, the greatest gift with Japan, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, those nations, um, is that, yeah, I, I felt that I got to be an insider and an outsider. And that, that was an incredibly rewarding and creative period of my career. Yeah, I must give you some incredible insights as a strategist to to be able to learn from so many different cultures. Like I'd imagine yeah. if you wanted to be, you know, whether you're a creative, to be honest, or, or a strategist, or just, you know, I don't know. I've always thought that travel broadens the mind and, and always, you know, if creativity is a combination of different things, traveling has got to be good for you. And I'd imagine yeah, yeah. staying uh, somewhere for a great extended period of time must have been really helpful for you. I mean, were, are there any like... Yeah. So key things that you've learned that that made you really go like, whoa, okay, like from from some of the different countries you've lived in. I mean, honestly, it, oh well, I mean, everything I thought I knew in China was different uh, right. from from filial responsibilities to the education system to. Uh, like the issues of success when you've come from a nation that in its memory can remember the absolute worst of possible times. Um, yeah, there was a, the, there were a huge one. I mean, it, but what I also find, fast, there was one guy, so I was working with Nike at the time and uh, sports in China was loved to be watched, not necessarily played because sporting system has a lot of challenges. Let's put it that way. And someone said to me, which I loved, he said, well, maybe maybe China has gone past the sport thing. Maybe it's not a case that you're trying to take them to where sport is. Maybe they did that 2,000 years ago and they've just moved on to the next thing. And it just fucked with my head. <laughs> <'Cause> I went, <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, it's like, and just that context of what is context, what is life, what is time, what are the aspects? I always thought when I lived in the UK, I found it fascinating that we did campaigns for England. when. Nottingham and Derby, 15 miles apart, have very different ways of translating certain different meanings, whether that's from language to literally uh, life choices. 
and yet we would treat England like the same. So China blew my mind, you know, or when you had global campaigns, I was like going, whoa, well, have, you, have you designed that? Have you designed that around it? So I remember doing a P&G campaign and I wrote this thing, which was in America, if your child loves sport, you'll drop them off at 9 a.m. and pick them up at 1 p.m. In China, if your only child is identified by the government as having sporting capability, you might drop them off at 9 a.m. and pick them up four years later. And and what was interesting is that was when tiger mums were a big thing and just just the prejudice and the ignorance came out. And uh, the sacrifice of love and some for the West, they would go, how could you do that? But in China, there's a whole different context of it. And for me to have, to be um, let in to have a, greater understanding was incredible but by the same time when I lived in America um I mean I talk about them a lot but Briar, uh, Maya and Chelsea three African-American women changed my life fundamentally genuinely fundamentally changed my life um and their generosity in helping me understand the the intricacies of the racial conflicts in, in America I mean, again, you know, that's a Western market that people think they know. And, and a lot of people who look like me don't. So I think the point of me travels, I agree with you, travels amazing, but you've got to want to learn. I met this guy in China. The first thing they said to me was, do you know where you can get this Belgian cheese? And I went, Belgium? Uh, it's like, like, and it's like, and of course, in China, you probably could get, get it anyway. But it was just this attitude of I wanted to recreate the life I had in Belgium, in China. You go, well, I appreciate some elements to that, but why would you not want to embrace it? And like in America, I was very fortunate with those three brilliant humans and others like, well, a whole bunch of them actually. But um, yeah, you've got to want to want to learn. And that's why I find it really frustrating when I hear strategists talk about curiosity, because what they actually mean is curiosity with a level of privilege versus curiosity with a level of culture. Right. And when you were mentioning about the Olympics, did you, uh, were you, you won some awards, didn't you, for the for Olympic ads? Um, was that- Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Was that, was that the P&G work that you did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, yeah, thank you, mom. Was that one? So that was that one of the insights that you came up with. You, you were, as you were saying that, I was like, that yeah, we, crazy, we, yeah. That that we did that. That was part of it. Um, yeah, especially as I said, because the Tiger Mom thing was going on. It was just like you just have to understand context. If you don't understand context, I understand why that looks that can look brutal. But you know, some of this they didn't even have a choice. Like it was a government decision. Um, and there were a lot of people involved in that, but the work we did um, across Asia uh, Pacific, yeah, it, it was it was great d just to find out what it's like to be a mom of a of an athlete. It's so different. Um, like, imagine you're the mom of an athlete in a sport that's never going to get worldwide acclaim, but the government have said you're really good at it. Like, in in that culture, a lot of children end up being almost like a this is a, a terribly crass way of saying it, but like the pension scheme, they will look after the family. There's something quite beautiful. It's almost, I was equated to the Italian side of that as well, the family. Um, but if you see your child following a career where you go, they're never going to be that um, financially successful, but they're doing it. There, there must be so much complexity and internal turmoil. And yeah, we wanted to highlight that because I think mothers in particular would connect to that once you... Mm -hmm you help them understand it from a family perspective rather than just the um, the outward cliches of it. Um, yeah, so it, I love that. I've got a lot of the films that we did to prove a point. So that obviously was just part of the, the creative journey. Right. And uh, I remember going home, actually. Um, we, so with that thing about you pick your kid up four years later, we went across China and spoke to parents who'd done it. And the challenges they had of just wanting to love their child, but they know they had all these challenges. I showed it to my wife. My wife's a, um, a Canadian Aussie, and she cried. And we didn't have a 
uh, Otis then. And I was like going, okay, well, if it's connecting to her because of the content and her context is so different, then w we've got to the truth of stuff. Um, that made me, yeah, I'm very proud of that stuff. Oh, it's one of the most beautiful ads I've ever seen in my life. Like, congratulations. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing oh, I was ad. a small cog, but yeah, it was, it was wonderful. Yeah. I mean, when you, you've worked across, again, lots of different brands, lots of different places, is there any kind of playbook that you have in, you know, for yourself when you, when you, I guess there's a couple of things that were going through in my mind. One of them was, you know, when you go to a new country and you start a new agency, are there a few things that you always do that help set yourself up for success? And the second one was when you're sold, okay, Rob, <laughs> please, can you help us on insert name of brand yeah are there a few things that 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 you try and do again to set yourself up for success in that so i guess it's kind of too too separate but possibly slightly interesting. i mean when when i move to a new country um first of all it's it's know that you don't know one of the worst things is when you try and post rationalize something through a context that you understand uh, so skin whitening cream, okay, one of the worst, worst possible cultural jail products ever made in man. And I remember talking about the harm it had done for um, for women uh, from uh, the Asian uh, markets and how it had basically let, the, it was a cultural jail. Um, and part of that is somewhere deep, deep uh, down in history, there's a belief that if you have white skin, you you come from a family that didn't, have to work in the, the fields. And some companies right. have exploited that for financial gain. Horrific. And then I was talking to somebody in the UK about that. And they said, oh, it's a bit like sun fake suntan lotion, isn't it? And I said, what do you mean? They said, you know, people want to put fake tan on so they look healthy. And I said, no, no, I appreciate from your context that might look quite similar. There's a whole other fucking world. And but I saw that all the time where people took their context. So when I moved to a country, it's like understand their context v versus trying to understand my, my, put it through mine. Actually, put the effort into want to learn. That's a big part of it, and expand your references for who you can learn from. So I often work with. I often go to police stations straight away and just hear about what a, like what petty crime. I talk to a late night uh, um, radio hosts. I talk to teachers. A bunch of different people. And I just go and meet people, and then I get a, I get a soup of possibilities in there versus just one person. But you have to want to do it and make the effort. Um, but trust the people around you and hire really well. Um, and you're, you're sure the police station thing isn't just you harking back to your childhood of wanting to be. Yeah, maybe. Person. And I've been arrested a lot of times for being stupid. <laughs> but um, but now, like, even when I came to Auckland, and you know, I I spoke to the police and said, what what's there, what what's part of the the issues of crime and they and this copper said to me kids are bored here and that led to us doing a book called dream small which was a research project i sent um some planners and a photographer across new zealand and just walked the streets and talked to people and it, it definitely that, that definitely proved out to be part well true but with other aspects and then as regards problems i mean my biggest thing is like what's the actual problem versus what do you want the problem to be and then, as I said, I, I am culturally driven. So I, I want to know what the subculture is that's the most influential in what they're doing and if they recognize it and then find out what the tension is and where they could go. Because I, I'm a big believer that when you talk to a subculture and you understand where they're going and you liberate that, they actually act as a beacon and a magnet to pull broad culture up to it versus just yeah. talk to as many people as you can. So in New Zealand, there's only 5 million people here. So there's a mentality. You can talk to everyone at once. And you probably could. You like You probably could. But... Being able to communicate to everyone at the same time doesn't mean that you're connecting to everyone, but there's this attitude. So for me, it's like, well, who are actually do we have to talk to versus who could we talk to? And there's a big difference. Um, and some people don't agree, and that's fine. We'll never be good people to. I mean, I'm at a point where, um, which is really arrogant if I think about it, where I haven't got the patience or the time. Um, I appreciate there are other ways of working. But this is my way of working. Um, What's, and what, could you uh, give me an, yeah. an example? I I I, I love what you were saying with that, like the finding the subculture, and then can you have you have you got like an example off the top of your head that you can think of where 
Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, even if you, okay, so if you, let's talk about sport just because it's universal and everyone yeah. can uh, reference that. Just because you watch football doesn't mean you're a footballer. It means you love right. watching football. In fact, most times you love watching a team. Right. But that's very different to someone who actually is an athlete or thinks of themselves as an athlete. And the issues and the tensions and the concerns that they have, and what their will is. Like if you're watching it, like I love Nottingham Forest. I get up uh, on godly hours. I fly to the UK when, when it's a big game. Like I'll do all that. But that's very different to someone who's getting up and playing a game and facing the challenges and where every aspect of it affects their life from the fashion they wear, the clothing, the programs, the films, the music. They hear things, they see things differently. If you ignore that, you're just talking at people. But if you embrace that, you're doing things for people and speaking as an insider, not an outsider. And a lot of people can think that that's a lot of time and energy wasted. Um, mm -hmm. But the most powerful brands in the world have a clear position in culture that are talking because they are part of the culture. They're not trying to buy in and they prove it by their actions. You, anyone in, it's a bit like in the 90s when agencies tried to show kids with a baseball cap back to front. That was the, that's, hey, I'm a skateboarder type thing. You just go, yeah. the, well, you're not, you're, the only people you're fooling are the people who are fools. Um, yeah. So a lot of it is nuance and detailed. But yeah, I, I'm a big believer in understanding that I have people who are part of that culture or younger than me because obviously I'm too old. Um, but yeah, I take a great amount of effort. Like we're working on a range of projects at the moment. Well, when we've said to them, we appreciate that's who your audience is, but the people who influence that the most are this group, and we need to understand the behaviors. We need to understand them, not get answers from them, understand them. Um, we spend a lot of time. Like that is my, that's, that's part of the identity in my plan department. That's interesting. And maybe I was, that was, maybe that was a small thing that I, maybe I'm not understanding that, but I, I loved what you just said. You said your target audience is not necessarily your target audience. It's the influence. It's the people that your target or the audience are influenced by. Yeah. Right. Amazing. <laughs> like it's, it's very rare that you hear someone say something like that. Uh, that sort of simple. Um. You. You. I mean. I. I the. The way that I. Uh, I wanted to set up this call was uh, we were talking earlier before the the podcast started um mutual friend with with Rory Sutherland and he had gone to one of your talks and you you call it your Jerry Maguire talk and I think you said you're yeah. you're going to do it in, in can and I don't know whether this is part of it or or, or not I was reading in your blog you said that he most advertising today is he you find it's annoying because it seems to be either stupid or or, or serious um <laughs> is there any way you can share a little bit about um about that and your thoughts of, you know, what, explain well, that. Well, I, 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 I just feel that um, people care about what, what's important to them, not what we want them to be important to them. And right. in our quest to, I just feel that we've become so formulaic, honestly. Um, mm. There is definitely process and standards that are necessary and important, but we've become so fucking formulaic. And yet the, and yet if you look in culture, so much exciting stuff is going on. Um, and because they're more open to things. I mean, even let's talk about succession. When you look at how succession's written and the role of the writer's room. And the writer's room is that basically anything goes if they think it's really exciting. You wouldn't yeah. get that in advertising structures. Advertising structures is, is logic. It, it's being... Advertising is in danger of only looking down to move forward. But the things going on in culture that are exciting, whether it's Cortez, whether it's uh, Succession, whether it's um, what, certain video games or whatever, they're looking up and taking leaps. And they're taking leaps and people run and follow them. I mean, if you look at a brand like Gentle Monster, I'm, I'm, I'm quite lucky I get to work with those guys. You know, they're an eyewear company, but if you saw them, the way they take what they do and how they do it. And like they're, they're kind of like an engineering company at the same time with tech and, and the future. And I did some stuff with SKPS, which is 
on the edge of a universe. So when you're in the, it's the most profitable uh, luxury street culture uh, retailer on the planet. And it's been designed to feel like you're on Mars, like just incredible stuff. You would never get that following a lot of the, well, the vast majority of um, advertising modeling. And I get it. Marketing is expensive and there's a lot of risk involved. But in the quest to minimize risk, the other side is you're uh, minimizing potential. And I, I work really well with clients who have a chip in their shoulder and want to change stuff rather than communicate stuff. Um, and that's why it's very clear the clients that I'm really good at and the clients I'm a nightmare at. And it's, it's fair to say that um, it's not about a particular category. It's, it is an attitude and an ambition that drives me. Um, so I know, I, I know what I'm terrible at and I know what I'm good at. And now it's been going on for so long. I've lived in so many places. I've got, a, I've got the sort of clients that know who I am and what I do and the ones who wouldn't touch me with a 10 foot barge pole. And I'm comfortable with that. I don't, I don't have to prove to, I'm not saying that they're wrong. The people who we have a different, I'm not, but I equate it to, um, well, someone once said it, they said to me, you follow a different religion. And it was quite a nice way of saying it. And I went, yeah, I do. <laughs> so what, I mean, um, there's lots of stuff going on. I mean, we're, we're, we're recording this and it's sort of a, probably a month and a bit out from, from Cannes. There's lots yeah. of work coming out at the moment. Are there any things right now, I don't know, off the top of your head, can you think of like three brands that are doing good work or even one? Or can you think of uh, and maybe maybe three where you're like, what on earth were they thinking? I mean, the vast majority sometimes I think of what are they thinking uh, or, well, no, it's, I know what they were thinking. I was just, I just think a lot of it's quite lazy, obvious stuff. Um, like there's a huge disappointment with the airline industry. There's so much potential with that. I've worked with one in particular for a long time. They've gone through a lot of change and I've seen what they've done. It's just... And I know that market's particularly hard, but it's also an amazing opportunity for them. Um, Was that? But yeah, Virgin? I think, uh, yeah, Virgin Atlantic. Um, you've, just really quickly while you're on Virgin, yeah. you, I read something that you said that, from, again, I think it was in one of your blogs, and I thought it was so amazing. Well, two things. One was, <laughs> did Richard Branson call you an asshole? And the second yeah, one I've was. Yeah, I've been called an asshole by a lot, yeah. Did, did, um, the, the, there was an insight for the lounge, which I thought was amazing. Make people, oh, make people want to miss their plane. Yeah. Love it. What a simple, yeah. what a beautiful. But that was from Branson, to be fair. That was right. like, um, but yeah, I mean, just the, the articulation of, I mean, it could have been create a lounge that uh, capitalizes on the values of the Virgin Atlantic brand and, and reassures business class customers that made the right decision. Or make people love the land so much they'd rather miss the plane you go fuck love it. it's just got a different energy and that and that's someone who gets who they are and what they do um but who who are brands that i think are doing interesting stuff i think palace are really interesting um like the fact that gucci have done a, a collab with a skateboard company is fucking amazing but street culture i think is phenomenal in itself because it's become, it influences like high-end luxury. As I said, SKPS, Mr. G, most profitable luxury street culture brand on the planet, uh, retail on the planet. Like it, I, I find that sort of thing, yeah, I find that sort of thing really good. And there's, there are brands that are much smaller who I find really interesting. And as I said, I find the gaming community also interesting, more for, well, some members of the gaming community, more because of their, their, bravery in that sense and and then i look at cortez which a lot of people don't understand how they've achieved such like a momentum again street culture brand but again they've done a deal with nike and nike i'll always love nike i spent a long time with those guys um and i still think that they're number one but then i can look at metallica you know it's a, a niche brand on one side because of the music they play but they're the second most successful American group in musical history, you know, and because of the way they expand. So there's, there's lots of stuff. I, 
nobody wants to be inauthentic. But I think those that have realized that by being vulnerable, you can be even more authentic and you embrace it, they excite me. And, that, and that's why for me, I love creativity more than advertising. And I love subcultures more than just women 18 to 59 or 54, I should say. Just because I think you, you find out you find out stuff that you go, wow, that you find out the tensions they're going, you see the opportunities where you can, where everyone wins or you try to do it um, but a, and give a brand a really strong point of view. Um, a lot of brands don't have a strong point of view. And for me, that's when it gets mucked up. I'll tell you a brand I really like at the moment, it's Kia. Um, okay. I, I just think, like I said, there was a lot of talk that their logo, you can't, nobody knows what their new logo says. And I'm like going, and they're saying it like it's, oh, so it's wrong. And I go, well, one, it's not that hard to find it if you want to know. But two, the design of the cars, the way they've looked at it, that the whole, they've found, they've found their voice. For me, I think they've found their authentic voice and they're really interesting. I'm really interested to see what, what they're going to do. They're challenging conventions. They're not doing it for just, you know, some of the brands in the past have been a bit Samsung-y where you've added stuff just to try and look different. But they're, yeah, I, I'm really quite fascinated by uh, Kia at the moment. I'm really interested to see what happens. Uh, again, th their choice of designer has made such an impact. But every aspect of it, and we're getting into all these rules where you go, I reckon Kia shouldn't be successful. Metallica shouldn't be successful. Gentle Monster shouldn't be successful. Cortez shouldn't be successful. But they are more successful, more sustainable, and have a disproportionate impact, like Liquid Death, than a lot of the brands who are very established. And and that to me is fascinating because we're not going to grow if we just um, place such markers on what can be done that we yeah that, that we never get a chance to do it because culture knows what it wants it doesn't know how to articulate it and you know people can slag off liquid death saying oh it's very very small and it is i think they made 130 million last year turnover which is nothing and coke coke made i think 25 billion dollars of profit over four billion dollars of marketing so incredible return on investment but looking the numbers of liquid death a bit more and proportionately the impact they've had on culture and the awareness far exceeds coca-cola that's not saying you've i think coca-cola finally got back a bit on track but it's just like but there's there's real growth and they've got loyalty built in like a fan base a proper fan base and like going so don't tell me that shit don't tell me that that model doesn't work i'm not saying that it is more successful than coca-cola but but for return on investment it's got a better one so let's look at that as well versus just this very a lot of people playing at being business people rather than being uh, understanding business uh, incredible examples and i agree with you and on kia as well it's phenomenal watching that company turn around and what they've been doing are, are there any brands that you absolutely love but you're like oh god guys what are you doing uh, <laughs> come on <laughs> god, my, my brain always goes like i mean I, I don't love them because i have to be nike but i do question adidas like they go up and down like a fucking yo-yo um and the the easy thing hasn't helped them either um mm. but i, th I think and oh, i'll tell you one under armor like five years ago under armor were basically nike for the new generation and they've had a whole bunch of things it doesn't help that you know one of them was on trump's love love gang so to speak but it's like when a brand needs to do a watermark of their logo in the corner of their TV ad, because they go, that's attribution. I'm like going, well, you're, you, you, you're miles off because attribution um, is, you know, about doing interesting things, not just boring people into submission. So yeah, there's a, there's a few things like that where I okay, go, I could help you, but I could never help on drama. It's against my religion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know, have to phone up one of your friends and uh, and get some help. <laughs> so, yeah, that's uh, the best way. <laughs> and um, and is well, is the Jerry Maguire talk about that kind of stuff that we've just been talking about, or is it slightly different? 
It'll be slightly different because I'm um, doing it with Martin and Paula, two phenomenal humans who are just two of the best planners in the world. So we'll evolve that. Um, but the backbone is strategy is about imagination and it's getting weighed down by being about logic. There is a logic in what we do, but it's the logic is with all this information and possibility, yeah, we're shuffling in inches rather than taking leaps. And yeah, we want to put the imagination back in because ultimately that that's in the that's possible for all strategists rather than just the elite that happen to work in really um, good agencies with money to spend on stuff. That that's the basic premise. A quiet revolution. That's what I would love to um, start. Well, you, you, you've you've got bases in in many places now, and fans in many places now. So I'm I'm sure that quiet revolution is going to grow marvelously well. Um, so yeah, bravo. And um, there was uh, gosh, there was something else I had on the tip of my tongue, um, but I I totally lost it by looking down at a page of notes. Um, Don't worry. <laughs> What, just, I mean, just while I remember, you, when you worked at Wyden then, did you get to meet Dan and, and work with him as well? Yeah, Dan called me an asshole as well. He's another one. Yeah, he... Um, Congrats. Yeah, yeah, a, 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 another one on a long list. Um, it was a very... Well, it is a special place. But, um, yeah, he was an amazing human. Um, yeah. What he, what he and Dan and Dave Lur and a whole bunch of others, but um, what they built and the environment for going after what's right rather than necessarily what's the easy. Um, yeah, I, it's, uh, it's dead easy to sound glib, but it was a real honor to work for Dan. Uh, and you wanted to be great for him. And that's maybe the ultimate accolade uh, any boss could achieve. He never asked for that. That was also part of it. But you wanted to do it for him, for the the privilege and honour of being able to be there and being recognised that you could add something. So, yeah, he, he was amazing. Yeah, well, was a, I mean, I... I... Agree. He's an amazing guy. I was really lucky to have supper with him a couple of times when he was visiting Cape Town and um, yeah. with his wife. And I think that was, he was there for a conference and he announced um, it was when he announced the shareholding of Wyden and Kennedy and that it would always yeah, yeah. be private. Um, yeah. Yeah. With, with, with the, what were the kind of key takeaways that you, you, you took from working for there? I know you mentioned the culture and how, how marvelous that was. The culture, the, 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 the belief in subcultures and uh, cultural tension to get to great work, craft, um, always being forward thinking, but always looking to where things originated to get to the real truth of stuff. Um, that creativity was not uh, discriminated against by age. You were, val you were judged on what you did, not what you did, not what you had done. Like it was a very present energy. Um, yeah, and just the work comes first and lots of people can talk about that. Um, but it, what I also respected was there was a demand that you really looked into stuff and you worked hard. It, you couldn't find it in. People who found it in got found out pretty quickly. Um, yeah, it was, it was, the, I, they were amazing to me. Uh, above and beyond. I mean, when my mum died, they did something for me that will would mean that, I mean, they could basically burn my house down and I'd still probably feel quite okay about them. Um, but yeah, they were special. Um, yeah, the industry needed them and mm. maybe it still does. But there's there's others that I think are really interesting now and that that's a golden age. Um, but yeah, it's like uh, creativity is under threat. I honestly believe that um, because people want certainty. But the only way you get certainty is either be as boring as fuck or lie. And uh, what people forget is creativity can achieve things that logic can't. 
And so there's, yeah, widens there, there's a few of those. I, I love Neil's and Uncommon. Um, and I've said to his face, I don't always love every bit of their work, but I love, I, he's a fucking genius. Um, yeah. I really love Mischief. I think Greg's, yeah, epic. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of places. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of, a, a lot of them are small. Um, but there's some big ones. I mean, Martin's now AMV, and I think AMV did some amazing, it's amazing work, but I think they did the best TV in the UK for a long time um, and very recently as well. So, yeah, for me, there's some companies that are really great, but there's some amazing individuals as well. And so I will fight to support them as um, loud as I can, because I got I got that support and I got inspired by people who I think. Um, yeah, made a real impact by what they did and their beliefs. Um, I remembered what I was going to say, and I know that we're, we're running okay. out of time, so I'll, 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 we, no. we can close with this. But you, you said something. It was something you said earlier, which I was, I was like, oh, "Okay." You said, uh, "You said I, I love creativity. I don't like advertising." Yeah. <laughs> thought, um, there you go. <laughs> like that, I thought. I'm imagining this is going to be a good place to end on. <laughs> so, yeah, I love creativity. Like, <laughs> yeah, take it home. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> The best advertising has culture in it. Um, yeah. The best creativity is culture. But when it's advertising done in a vacuum, it can be, there's, uh, I'll leave you with this. There's a, um, there's a quote, of course, I've forgotten her bloody name, uh, Lucille Ball. And I'm gonna, I might get this wrong, but she said, uh, a man that can guess a, mom, a woman's age may be clever, but he's not very smart. And I love it because, I think there's a lot of creativity that, uh, well, a lot of advertisers that be clever, but not very smart because it's done in a vacuum. And when you understand the context of what's going on, the symbolism, the hidden meaning, the language, the nuance, the details, uh, that's when creativity and culture come together. And for me, that's what I'll chase after, not the advertising. Perfect. Uh, I thousand percent agree. We, we we made so many courses on creative topics and creative subjects. And one thing that always comes up is you can't find the answer or it's very unlikely you're going to find the answer from behind your laptop on your keyboard or yeah. on your laptop or whatever. You've got to get out there. You've got to speak to people, do things. And you've said that so often during our chat just now. So look, I really appreciate your time. Uh, keep keep on doing amazing work. Look forward to seeing you in Cannes. Um, hopefully yeah. see you in, in person and say hi. And, yeah. and thank you so much, Rob, for taking time. I know you're a busy Chris, don't, and... don't be silly. Thank you for inviting me. I mean, really a, a, a huge lapse of judgment on your part, but I'm eternally grateful for that. So thank you so much. <laughs> hey, you're an honour. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Rob. Cheers. Okay, mate. Take care.